was in it. <laughs> and so uh, they did a little privy council, whatever they call it, court case, and I would have won. So then the big money came out, a million bucks. And uh, they said, anywhere in the world, you can have a million bucks and uh, oh, all kinds of things. But meanwhile, uh, I felt that James Bond, you know, with, with wearing a suit, it can't last that long. And so, uh, but now it t turned around and it did. But I'm happy because I had a great life. I went off motocross racing and doing stupid things that people do who aren't concerned with acting. <laughs> and I, uh, I had a good life. I, you know, had great kids and had a lot of fun, uh, you know, hanging around the edges kind of thing. And if I wanted to work as an actor, I could have worked a lot. But I found that uh, a lot of the time actors just hang around them. And I like to do things, you know, so, uh, I, but I did like acting in the end. I went to uh, Charles Conrad's acting class for 20 years because it was real scripts with real actors and a lot of fun. Remember, we were there together. And uh, I had, uh, so I got hung up on acting, but you never got a job because, you know, you weren't an actor, <laughs> even though I'd been there for 20 years. I remember I was in Charles's class for about two years. I said, Charles, how come I'm not in the first eight grade class? He said, when you stop playing James Bond, I'll let you in. <laughs> That's all I knew. But then uh, he gave me a, a script for a girl one day, for an 18-year-old girl. It always had him, her on there. There was no describing the characters. And I started giggling and carrying on like an 18-year-old girl. He said, you've got it. Now you're in. <laughs> so but that was another story. I thought, Gee, why can't I get a job acting? Because most of the time, the scripts are written by three or four different people, and you got to fake it because it's like music. If, if it's not written in a rhythmic way, you know, your acting is not rhythmical. And so you have to fake acting <laughs> to be an actor in this world. But anyway, that's another story. Any questions? <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, it wasn't my idea. What happened was, they, I was doing my own stunts, you know, and I was jumping off bloody helicopters 20 feet in the air and stuff, and I said, I bet the other fellow didn't have to do this. And, and I kept saying every time, like I went in to uh, get my per diem, and it was 500 or 50 pounds a week, I can't remember the exact amount. It was a very small amount compared to Connery. And I said, how much the other fellow get? And, they, and the accountant looked at the producer and he said, tell him, a thousand. And, uh, and I went, said, give, him a, give him a thousand. But I was, I was up on the mountains and there was no way to spend it. So I filled up a briefcase full of cash. And I, I opened my briefcase in front of Telly Zavalas one day. He said, hey kid, you play poker? <laughs> <laughs> and so he's got half my money. And Harry Salzman, the producer who uh, used to be a professional gambler, yeah. and uh, he had to quit because he lost everything. But one day uh, he, he saw what Telly was doing to me. He said, Come move over, kid. And Telly said, No, Harry, no. And he got all my money back and he said, Leave my boy alone. <laughs> uh, that was the sort of things that happened. You know. yeah. yeah. Did you ever meet Louis Armstrong? Uh, no. In fact, I tried to stop Louis's music getting in because we were into hip hops and stuff, you know, and wanted pop music. I said, geez, that's too old. And now I love it. I mean, the guy was a master. And, uh, and I, I loved it. I love his uh, music, and they knew better than I did. <laughs> yeah. What was it like to work with Diane Rick? Oh, tough. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> I remember uh, I used to play chess with my uncle because he was bedridden from about 12 years old, so I learned to play chess pretty well. Then the guy I taught him was another doctor, and I could beat the folks at 12 years old. So I'm in Diana Rick's place, and she's with a boyfriend, and he, he played chess, as chalk, and he was like moving and going, walking off, and then moving, and I said, checkmate. He went, what? 
<laughs> so then he sets it up, and he planted it, he sat next to me and we played, I beat him again. He threw the board up in the air. And that's the first time Diana took any notice of me, because she thought it was a brainless wonder. And the next thing I know, I'm in Switzerland. She says, if you have nothing to do with any of the other girls, we may get something going. <laughs> and here she is giving me these instructions. And I, I was... Um, fooling around with the receptionist uh, in the stuntman's tent, because the stuntman's tent's full of mattresses. And, so, and, and, we're, and we're just about to uh, get a little cuddly, and uh, the stuntman, as Diana's walking past up the hotel, lifted up beside the tent. <laughs> I had he been there a week on the set. Next thing she God. <laughs> there he goes again. And then I remember with the girls, uh, you know, I was playing around with them. I won't tell you which one. Or... <laughs> I missed out on one anyway. <laughs> but I, I do remember coming out of my hotel room one day and they had a stunt doll tied up and hanging outside the door. I bumped into it and had a note on it. Here's one you haven't had, George. <laughs> so we had a lot of fun. And that was, uh, I didn't know any different. But, uh, I was just willing, ready, and willing, and able. <laughs> and, and, you know, there's nothing much to do up there that time at night. Oh, dear. So, uh, yeah. When you go back to I've been back already. A pay me, of course, not like tonight, where I'm not getting paid. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I'm, that's the 50th anniversary next year. Yeah. 50 years ago. Jesus, I'm still talking about it. But meanwhile, uh, they're going to give me a packet of money to go over to the mountain and say hello again. <laughs> And also, the, I'm going to Portugal, and they're paying me, so I can't refuse, you know what I mean? And uh, it's one of those things that I've been hanging around doing James Bond for 50 years odd now, <laughs> since then. But, uh, well, what would you do? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, 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 no. no. <laughs> he hasn't seen it. I'll tell you one thing about the final scene. I had learned a little bit about acting, and Diane was biting my leg after she was dead. <laughs> and I thought, why are you biting my bloody leg? And she said, to make you feel, you know, sad. <laughs> and, uh, it's not turning you on, but you stop it. <laughs> And so, next thing I know, I got into the scene that, and tears started to come. And the director says, James Bond doesn't cry. Cut out the tears. Anyway, I won't tell you any more about it. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. Yes. I heard in the early 70s uh, you've done some martial arts films and you got to know Bruce Lee a little bit. Can yeah. Can you tell us about how that came about? Well, I couldn't get arrested in London in the film business. So I'd been sailing for 15 months. I bought a boat, not to sail, but I ended up doing it. But I needed a roof over my head because I had no money. And hotels every night was 50 quid, 100 quid. And I said, Jesus. I don't want a caravan because I want to move around a bit. <laughs> so I went down to Malta after I did a little film in Italy called Who Saw a Dying? Killer Vista Morire. Yeah. And I uh, did that film, got 10 grand, went down to Malta, bought a catamaran, 35 foot. The guy that sold it to me gave me a little lesson. The next night I sailed for Sicily with, <laughs> for a girl, with a girl. Uh, and she. Uh, Later on became my wife, told me she couldn't have kids. Of course she did. <laughs> I said, you poor thing, come with me. But she couldn't have kids. <laughs> Next thing I know, um, we're in Sicily. I couldn't stop the boat. I found Sicily. 
But uh, I, I left it on 56 degrees or whatever it had to be, and she went to sleep. So I'm yelling, wake up, come and help me. And I fall off, you know, sailboat. And I sailed right into the harbor at a super cruise, I think it was. And then uh, I was flapping around in the middle of the harbor, and then some guy came out and helped me moor, moor the boat. Anyway, uh, that was what I did for 15 months. I sailed all around the Mediterranean in storms. I'd see the fishing boats coming in and they're saying, go back, go back. I said, down with you, I need the wind. It's <laughs> a bloody storm I'm going into. <laughs> and I didn't know nothing better. But meanwhile, I'm still here. And uh, <laughs> next thing I know, uh, I went back to London and you had a question about uh, Bruce Lee. Well, I, well, that's right. I went to the movies to see who's the biggest star, and it was Bruce Lee. And I knew he wouldn't answer the telephone because no film producer would answer the telephone to me. I'd like totally blacklisted. And so uh, I went. I went out and I got a check. No, first of all, I went gambling with this guy. He told me he had a system you couldn't lose. Of course, we lost. We lost everything. So I still had my ticket to Singapore. I thought that's where he was, because it sat on the film distributed Singapore, blah, blah, blah. Mm. So I headed for Singapore, and uh, when I got there, no, he's up in Hong Kong. <laughs> so I had to be nice to the, um, the ladies in the hotel, <laughs> who ran the hotel, and they got me a ticket up to Hong Kong. <laughs> I had to have lunch with some airline. But I went up to uh, Hong Kong, and the same PR girl in the hotel up there, gave me a free room, and then I went uh, next morning on a bus to see Bruce, because uh, I didn't have any money. And there's bloody people with dogs and cats and all, all kinds of animals on the bus that they eat up there. And so, it took hours to get there, and, the, and if you want to check the date, the biggest tornado that's ever hit Hong Kong was just happening. <laughs> to this day. There's never been a bigger one, three days before Bruce died. And I'm on this bus and it's shaking around. Finally, we get to the studio and I get talk the guy into letting me into Raymond Chow's office. And Raymond says, geez, James Bond, George Lazenby's here. Hey, Bruce, George Lazenby's here. Do you want to see him? No. <laughs> Damn it. So I'm back out hiding behind a telephone pole with all this corrugated iron and shit flying everywhere. And uh, next thing this little Mercedes pulls up. And the window's down about this far. Get in! I said, where? Because Bruce is curled up in the back. Mr. Hong Kong's driving and his secretary sitting on the other seat. said, you jump out, you jump in. So she jumps out, I jump in. And of course they were asking questions about my my masculinity, because she was sitting on my lap in Chinese. I said, what are you guys talking about? And they told me in English. So meanwhile, a, a police car pulls up. Get off the road. And then he said, Bruce Lee, the police car. You know, so we go into this about three blocks, and we're in a restaurant. And uh, Bruce says to me, uh, uh, George, how, if you and I had a fight, how long would it take me to beat you? And we said, hang on, I'll just, I'll, I'll, I'll show you what we're talking about. Uh, Raymond Chow, the producer, one second for me to beat him. <laughs> Mr. Hong Kong, maybe a minute. My wife, she's a black belt, a minute. There's another guy there, Andre Morgan, American, one second. He said, tell me, how long do you think it, I said, as long as it took you to court me, catch me, Bruce. And he said, good answer. Raymond, give George $10,000. And Raymond said, what for? I'm going to do a movie with him. And so uh, Raymond wrote out the check. Bruce took me to the house of the typhoon. Up down, he took me to a bank. Took me, you get a suit made in the day, and I had these old clothes that didn't, you know, been sailing for 15 months. And uh, he gave me a new suit. And uh, and he would call me at 3 o'clock in the morning. Here's my idea for the movie. Blah, 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 blah. blah. <laughs> call me back. <laughs> I'm like, what the hell was that? But that went on for three days. And then the last day I was there, he had a headache at lunchtime. He said, uh, I said, well, don't worry. Come tonight. You know, you got a headache. Relax. I'll come back as soon as I. Oh. My girlfriend on the boat, she was having a baby, the one that told me she couldn't get pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
I had to go back for the baby. And meanwhile, <laughs> he uh, said he had a headache, and I was sitting there with Raymond Chow waiting for Bruce to show up, and he was always early. He's always on time, and he wasn't there. So I called up his girlfriend, because he wasn't with his wife. And, uh, <laughs> and she said, I can't wake him up. I said, I'll call back in five minutes. If you can't wake him up, I don't care. I'm calling an ambulance. And I called back in five minutes, and she said, I've already called an ambulance. You're going to the hospital. I said, thank God for that. So I get to my hotel. By this time, I've got the honeymoon suite with a fountain. <laughs> I've got this one. Don't tell me what I did for that. But meanwhile, <laughs> I got... Uh, I got very friendly with the, the people there. But, <laughs> and next thing I know, uh, I got money, I got a new suit, I got the biggest room in the hotel. And meanwhile, she uh, says, you go to the hospital, I walk in the hotel room. And the phone's ringing off the hook. Pick it up, Bruce Lee's dead. What do you think? It was a reporter who knew I was hanging out with Bruce. So, uh, that was the end of that, and I went back to London, and next thing Raymond Chow calls me, you've got $10,000 of mine, you've got a Kung Fu movie for me. I said, I don't do Kung Fu, and uh, that's all you do, right? <laughs> so, he said, I send a man over to London, he teach you. Yeah, right, okay, bye. He does send a guy over. <laughs> and he's a rough son of a bitch, he was up for murder in Singapore. <laughs> So, he, he's got me jumping and twisting and turning and kicking and carrying on for about four hours the first day. I had to crawl up the stairs to get to bed that night. I was so stiff already. I got to bed and I told my wife, by then, or wife to be, uh, that if he can't, and when he comes in the morning, tell him I'm not here. <laughs> so he comes the next day, and he says, I do, he'd say that. And he comes and drags me out of bed, stretches me out, and starts me doing it again. For four months, he got me going, so I could do it eight or nine hours a day. Because you're doing a movie, and you got to kick and twist and jump, and occasionally say a word in these Chinese movies. <laughs> but you just, you know, bam, all, all day long. I remember it was quite funny because I had a, a guy in the uh, airport in a uh, restaurant in Sydney. I was down there after I'd done like two of his movies. And he comes up and he drops a bit of spaghetti in my dinner. I said, What did you do that for? Oh, my girlfriend thought I said I wouldn't be game because they knew I was doing kung fu movies. Didn't he? <laughs> and so it just so happened that when I was leaving, his dinner arrived. <laughs> I couldn't help but push the whole dinner at his lap. I said, Jesus, I thought I wouldn't be getting to do that. <laughs> he gets up to the waiters, grab us, and throw us out the street. He comes running at me, and I had to be so accurate. I hit one of the Chinese guys once by accident and uh, just tipped him on the chin, and he was a bit wobbly. And then we're having lunch, and he they all pulled with my jacket over my head, and they jolly horse my legs. And at the time I went back like this, they're all eating. <laughs> figure out which one I want. And so they said, don't hit us, ever. This is our job, this is our life. If we don't work, we're fired. You know, these guys used to do bouncing at the nighttime, the nightclubs, and work on the stunts during the day. And meanwhile, um, I pulled a muscle in my back hmm. one day, ooh, because I didn't uh, warm up in the mornings like you're supposed to. <laughs> and so I was back in the hotel that night, and I was just about to get in the bath, and my back locked up. Hmm. And I was standing there with one foot in the bathtub, and I could reach the phone that was in that fancy room. And uh, I said, can you send someone up? I need some help. So I said, a woman up. And here's my leg in blood sitting there. <laughs> and she comes in and goes, ah! And out. <laughs> And then I uh, got, uh, got some doctor over. He was Australian, actually, in Hong Kong. And he did the biopsy on Bruce, so I heard all about it. And meanwhile, to cut a long story short, the stuntmen showed up at my door because they heard I couldn't walk. Hmm. Six of them. And they carried me through the streets of Hong Kong to a Chinese doctor. And I was all animals in these bottles. <laughs> and everything was going, and I can't object because I couldn't move. <laughs> and they laid me on the stomach, and him and his daughter worked on me, because apparently when you pull a nerve or something, there's a little bit of 
glue on the end of it. Mm -hmm. And if they get it back together in time and then put a poultice on you, mm -hmm. this poultice they put on back and smell it coming out in the hallway. Mm -hmm. It was really bad. <laughs> but I was so happy to be able to move. I got up and walked out. I went to go in the Chinese restaurant. The guy came around. You can't come in here. You mean the Chinese doctor? <laughs> well, you get used to it, you know. You know. <laughs> so, anyway, that was my Bruce Lee experience. And the next thing I, I George, no, wait a minute, wait a minute, April, April. Any more questions? George, question George, is... tell them about the film you made after Bond. Pardon? Yeah, I'm here in the U.S. I had four kids here. Bloody thing. I got tell, them about, <laughs> tell them about George. George. George, tell them about Universal Soldier, the film you made. Tell them about Universal Soldier. My what? The film that you produced and wrote. Oh. Yeah, tell them about Universal that. Universal Soldier? Yeah. Oh, what, what's it to tell about the fact that I couldn't get it released? You know, it was well, like, uh, we got made. Uh, yeah. Who's Don Factor gave me the money? Hmm. And uh, I didn't have any money, but uh, it was just, the, well, I was living in a five bedroom apartment in London. I had <coughs> six girls staying there, I think. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, uh, but it belonged to George Drummond, who owned Drummond Bank. Mm -hmm. Uh, he's the Queen's banker, right. and he uh, got caught trying to smuggle some money out of the country <laughs> to start Caroline Airlines. Huh. Radio Caroline they had the boat where they launched all the British pop groups. Mm -hmm. Well, George put up the money for that, and he was about to put up the money for Air Caroline. So they did this number on him with hmm. smuggling money, and so he lost his uh, right to his money. But he was. He had a Lamborghini and you know, five or six bedroom apartment, and we were sharing it. And he had a place in Barbados, and he had to stay in Barbados for a while. So I had this great setup for nothing, you know. <laughs> and every now and then he said, Would you mind running my Lamborghini now and again? <laughs> no, it's fine. Well, good enough for you. And so and the girls would come back sometimes with me from somewhere, and they'd see the car, and they'd say, Oh, is that yours? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd take him up the freeway at about 140 miles an hour. I'd say it's all playing. <laughs> <laughs> next, thing, next thing I know, um, you know, I've got you know, a life like you can't believe. It. Hmm. Without, and I'd done James Bond, and I didn't have that good a life. I didn't have some money. Well, they as quick as that way. We can <laughs> anyway, i got to stop bragging. <laughs>